Uh, hello, everybody. This will be a, a very fast session because I only have 109 slides. Um, seriously, I only have 109 slides. Uh, this has been through a lot of title changes, uh, but essentially it's about persistence, performance, speed, and a number of other things. I pulled back some of the technical detail, but I did include a list of references at the end of this, so all of the papers and things if you actually want to uh, read up on some of the things that I've said that I'm using to back up the outrageous statements that I'm going to be making, most of which are pretty outrageous. So, um, here we are. Uh, just a quick intro uh, about me. I've been a developer. I worked on Unix kernels and database kernels and porting databases. And I was an application developer. And I've held every job in IT. I was a janitor in a data center. And I've been a CIO and a CTO. And the interesting thing is that in doing that, I've been able to make mistakes across the entire breadth of an IT organization. And I've gotten really, really good at that particular thing. So. Uh, I did become a CTO, which was great because then I could tell other people what to do because I got tired of the developer BS because developers don't talk to database people and the database people's BS with not talking to developers and everybody's always talking across each other without understanding the underlying data principles behind things. And so uh, what I discovered then was that nobody in the business understands anything and being a CTO just means different people argue with you. So um, I've done a lot of stuff. One of the things that I'm very interested in is the history and patterns. So I'm going to start this with a completely non-technical topic for about 10 minutes, which is a brief history of data storage and retrieval, which is, is only technical in the theoretical sense. Because if you look at the problem, uh, we've been talking about information overload and scale problems well for a long time. We don't really have good records before about 1550 about the problems of scale. So so many books, we don't have time to read the titles, uh, which is sort of like I can't get past the first page on Google. So we'll go back to the beginning, which is when, when writing was, was created, right? So we're talking about uh, uh, sedentary civilizations. We're talking about approximately 5,000 years ago. And we used to use these counting things. We used counting sticks and stuff like this. And these are sort of like coins. Each one means something. It's not abstract math, and it's not symbolic. But once you invent writing, then you have a different thing, because now you no longer have the stuff which you can lose. This is actually a contract. Um, you would put the recordings and the shapes and the sizes, dictate how much and for what kind of product, and then you wrap them up in this thing so that you have a little encryption envelope over it so other people can't snoop on your contracts. And uh, it's, it's an interesting technique. Now, we did invent writing. So the first information explosion was all about these. These are clay tablets, Sumeria, Mesopotamia, all through the Indus Valley and spreading throughout the whole region. They're about hand size, they're about this big. So you can see how much you can fit on one of those using a pointed stick to make these marks in this stuff. And this is actually, um, I did learn to read a lot of this stuff a couple of years ago just to be able to interpret it. But what you're seeing here is really important to software developers. It is beer. So we're talking about a beer tally here. And we're talking about the amount of grain that goes into it and other things. And so you've recorded all of this in an abstract representation of letters and numbers, which is great. Now, what happens when you start to get a lot of these things? Well, first of all, you know, you look at it. You have storage and retrieval and communication, because this stuff's heavy. This is actually a letter that people would mail. And the letter comes in an envelope. And sometimes it doesn't all fit on one page, so you have a little second page. Um, and it, it's still recognizable today in its, in its basic structures. But when you get a lot of them, you need something. You need metadata. Metadata, when you have lots and lots of those tablets, is about the tablets. So you're now creating tablets about tablets. And you're categorizing them. The, the library at Asher Banapal, which was one of the biggest, had different sections where they organized information into different um, units. And really, it was sort of like classifying data and then putting it all together. And um, it's very much like if you tried to deal with one of these, it's a lot like dealing with HDFS, because HDFS doesn't really have any metadata. And I don't count H catalog. It's a very primitive thing. It's sort of like one of these, which is that these and the data can become disjoint and lie to you. 
And if you've ever used Hive on top of data stored in HDFS, you understand what can happen because you can count the stuff with the program on the one side and you can query the data via Hive on the other side and you'll get two different numbers because the schema is sort of optimistic. Now, uh, what we ended up with is some interesting things. They kept these in baskets. So when you have a basket full of these, it's not too bad. When you have many baskets, it starts to become a problem. So they drilled holes in the tablets, put a little papyrus tab on there, and then wrote things on papyrus. So we actually had tagging infrastructure and folksonomies back then. And uh, eventually, it got even more complicated, and we started to create tablets about what was inside the tablets, not just the tax receipts are over here, and the barley production is here, and the beer dispensary is over here. It was things like synonym lists, and breaking stuff up, and keeping more detailed and deeper records. And you'll notice these things are kind of big now. Um, because we're worried about what's inside the documents, as well as just where the documents are, because we're dealing in aggregates. We're not dealing in one clay tablet for one farmer in one field. We're dealing with all the clay tablets for all the farmers in all the fields because we're trying to start doing forecasting. We're trying to use the information to figure out who's dodging their taxes and not paying any money. And so um, we start to create this kind of stuff. There's some seats over here if you need a seat. Um, so what we've got then is more metadata and more interesting things. And we discover some stuff about clay tech as we're looking through all of these little tablets. One of the interesting ones is some of the limitations that you have, very much like um, nine track tapes, if you ever worked with them, which I did a long time ago, or punched cards. You know, those things are all uh, write once, read many. You can't, you can't write them more than once. Kind of like HDFS is an append-only file system. So what you see right here is that when somebody makes a mistake, they have to chisel it out. Um, and so it's not very effective. Updates are expensive, just like in databases. Now, one of the things about how they, they maintain this stuff that I find very fascinating is uh, uh, these tablets also have edges. This one doesn't, but it's called an insipid and you can write on the edges. And somebody doing a PhD dissertation discovered uh, some decomposed wooden shelving with a whole lot of these, and they were all inscribed on three edges. On one edge, you had the type of grain that was produced. On another edge, you had the person. And on another edge, you had the, the year of, of uh, harvest. What you essentially had was a multi-dimensional OLAP cube. They were creating uh, three-dimensional hypercubes uh, to index the data because then you could rack these things up and somebody asked a question like, what was the barley harvest in this district last year, the year before, and the year before that? So that you could see if they were dodging taxes or do a forecast. And the only way to do that uh, efficiently is to have these things organized and structured laid out in sequences. So they're storing these things in sorted order now. Oh, it, this goes on for a long time. We have thousands of years of this before we get to paper. The invention of paper tech started with uh, bamboo press paper. We got to papyrus uh, and eventually to scrolls. Now, it's lighter, right? There's a lot less atoms. They're a lot more portable. It's a lot denser storage medium because you can write much smaller on it and store things bigger. So capacities goes up, information density goes up. And we end up with the first real libraries that include things that you might want to read, but also we need new metadata techniques. When information density goes up by an order, or in this case, two orders of magnitude, uh, you know, the, the atoms per bit changes drastically, and you have things like this that require headers and footers. But this is very much a serial scan-based system. You can't random access a scroll. And so uh, we also discovered some things about impermanence, you know, just like disk drives that fail periodically, is that whenever there's a revolution because people don't want to be paying their taxes anymore, they burn this stuff down. Now, when you started a fire and it was full of clay tablets, it made them permanent because it baked them. Uh, in the world of paper, there was a little problem of instability. So um, now, with scrolls, you have continuous reading. Start here, end here. With codices and books, you have random access. Now, the interesting thing is if you make them big like this, and the random access, until you have invented some new technologies for indexing, like 
an index or a table of contents or page numbering. Until somebody invents those techniques, these things are not much different than a scroll, but once they invent them, suddenly we have a way to go right to a particular place in a book. We can begin to record things differently. We can record mathematics and tax receipts and a lot of other stuff. We kept evolving. We moved from handwritten scrolls and handwritten codices uh, to printing, so we got full high definition, uh, RGB graphics, higher, you know, smaller form factors. We got portables. You know, books used to be this big, now they're little chat books. Um, and it keeps going on and on. The technology gets better. Until eventually we were producing so much stuff that the things that we're printing become more important in the printer. And we're at that point today. We're at the point today where the printer, we're focusing on technology. But the printer is not as important as what it's printing, the data. And so if we move forward into the more interesting times, the modern era, right? We go to the Elizabethan era, and now we've got all of this stuff. Perfect copies. We're creating topical catalogs. We've standardized fonts. Nobody realizes how important this is. But when you were writing Latin, there was a priestly font. There was an aristocratic font. There was a more plebeian font. And these things could not be read the same. And so they were incompatible. So you could write the same letter in three different writing schemes. And it was like doing EBCDIC versus ASCII versus Unicode. And so they standardized these things so that there was not a problem. That took a long, long time. And uh, they began to deal with taxonomy because there's so much information, we now have to figure out how to organize and structure and store it. We go from 8 million books in 1500 to 200 million books in 1600. So in that, that time span, and of course, commoditization, and when you have that, you have overload. So we end up with even better stuff. We've got title pages and colophons and tables of contents. And uh, finally, we get to the Georgian era. This is the era of of natural history. This is where things in my mind get really interesting because now we've got uh, a big dispute between Linnaeus and Buffon and nobody knows who Buffon is. Does anybody here know who Buffon is? Yes. You get the prize. I'll give you my phone later. Um, so that's Buffon, right? But who cares about Buffon? Well, he was a really smart guy. He didn't believe that species were fixed. You see, Linnaeus and we use the Linnaean taxonomic system for plants and animals today, species, you know, genus species designations. His taxonomic classification is fixed. Every time you have to insert some new species you've discovered into the tree, you have to rebalance the tree. In a database, it's not too bad. On paper, it's a nightmare. Um, unfortunately, Buffon's method was a faceted classification scheme. Name value pairs is essentially how it worked. It's very flexible when you do it that way. But the problem is that the technology can't afford that flexibility because paper tech, when you have to rewrite the index every time you add new facets and rewrite the things that point to it, to the actual data, become very expensive. But his was very bottom up because he knew that species were different and species were changing all the time, whereas Linnaeus believed God created them, they're just like this, and nothing shall ever change. And once we've discovered all of them, and there can't be many more than are in Europe, because Europe is where everything started. So, of course, uh, you know, that this debate went on for a long time. He won. Uh, Buffon lost, and we moved on. And then in the Victorian era, you know, now we've got steam-driven printing, the Enlightenment, um, massive amounts of engineering and specialized books on everything, the perfection of a stereotyping process, and we end up with this. Cutter, the Cutter classification system for books and technical manuals. 1882, bottom up, it's a faceted classification system, tags. It's a more flexible structure than your standard Dewey Decimal system, which is the other person on the other side of this argument, and he's saying, well, uh, and so, by the way, his name is Melville. Now, normally Melville is spelled M-E-L-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Uh, he took off the L and the E because it was more efficient to write his name. So he was an efficiency expert. Um, this, that's actually true. And so static structures, right? The Dewey Decimal System gives you numbers. And the numbers do not dereference to a book, whereas his system dereferences to a single title on the shelf. His does not. His takes you to a shelf, and then you have to do a scan across that shelf. 
It's like reading a page in a database. You, you, you know which page things are on, but you don't know which row it is until you've read all the rows. And the, the thing is, this is static. You define it once, you go to the bookshelf, and you throw new books on. You don't have to worry about where on the shelf to put that book, whereas in his system, there's a sequencing and an ordering, and so each thing has to be inserted. Now, when you take into account this and the problems of steam-driven printing, they were solving all sorts of problems about ingest and consumption simultaneously, and this one uh, lost and this one won, despite the fact that this one is the better system. And so you end up with, just like Linnaeus and Buffon, a top-down, rigid, taxonomic schema one. And the same thing happens in libraries. And so why did they win? Well, Linnaeus versus Buffon, it was the limitations of paper, and it was the fact that good enough wins the day. You know, this is good enough for us to get our job done and share things. In an era when it might take a month for a book to travel between two cities with some new information in it, everybody's taxonomies get out of sequence. It's a replication problem. When you have a replication problem and you're trying to work on scientific classifications, you need something that's going to remain stable. You can't have eventually consistent doing biology. And so that's why he won. If you look at, at uh, the Cutter classification system versus, uh, versus the Dewey Decimal system, it wasn't solving the problem you think it was. Because by that time, they were producing so much data that it took libraries longer to shelve books than the rate of inflow of new books. And so the efficiency expert figured out how to best shelve books the fastest way possible so librarians could get around to helping you find the books in the library rather than just constantly loading the stuff and letting you figure out how to get there. And it also enabled some self-service because if you knew the classification scheme here or here, you could find the information you were looking for. You could self-serve. And so pragmatism. Being pragmatic about the total set of problems you're trying to solve is important. In the library system, one was not pragmatic because you had to change so much stuff every time and the technology didn't permit it. The same thing with Buffon. Buffon loses for that same reason. It's not practical. And so that's where these things got to. Now, history's always the same. These patterns repeat and repeat and repeat top-down versus bottom-up, which is essentially rigid schema versus flexible schema. Do you give people autonomy, which means things can become out of sync without mechanisms to maintain that? Uh, who controls it? Uh, is it hierarchy versus network? All those taxonomies and library classifications are tree-structured, whereas all of the bottom-up faceted classification and tagging is networks. And so you've got this network hierarchy kind of a problem. And power versus ease. It's powerful to have something which is network oriented and flexible, but it takes a lot of effort to use it. And so these are the kinds of things. You're making trade-offs in every engineering decision. And so this teaches us a few things. You know, information requires schema. It requires changes when scale changes when the information density from clay to various types of paper and scrolls to codices to books and the rate of increase of that, that changes organizing principles because the old system was designed for an order of magnitude simpler work. And that's where we are with databases and things today storing and managing data. And so at some point, you're going to create enough stuff that it's going to tip. And the problem will no longer be production, which is OLTP, which is transaction processing, which is what a lot of us here are dealing with, application development. And it tips to the other side, data consumption in our case. And when that happens, then you really have to focus on dissemination and consumption and how you get data back out of these systems. And so first you record, then you deal with the other side of the coin. Now, this has gone on for thousands of years. In each technology regime change, there was a, a one to several orders of magnitude increase in information density. And that's when things get interesting. And that's when we get to this, this focus on production to consumption. And so, to repeat 
the grand cycle, which is we create a technology, it enables us to do really neat new things. Then we have to come up with methods to cope with this stuff. And once we've come up with those methods, like libraries, for example, or card catalogs, then we can take advantage of what's out there and use it. And then that creates the possibility of new things, which creates new technologies, which feeds right through. If you look at the database industry, that's exactly what we've seen, and this is what leads to big data. It's just that in previous versions, big data wasn't digital. So I love this quote. The most amazing achievement of the computer software industry is its continuing cancellation of these staggering gains made by the hardware industry. Um, so I'm going to take us through just a little bit of scaling history. Uh, question, why doesn't your database scale? Who's having scalability problems? Uh, wh why doesn't your database scale? The, the problem of storing that he said is normalization and taking the data that's coming in from trades, breaking it out, storing it, that takes effort, and then pulling it back out and having to piece all of the things back together. I mean, anybody else problems, performance? I would thought somebody would just shout out, relational databases suck. I'm kind of disappointed in you guys. Um, and so, um, uh, w which leads me to, uh, you know, some things, and, and that actually is, is a complaint, not so much about the relational model, but about how SQL was implemented with the relational model, which was very different. SQL and the relational model are two different things. They actually came about at different points in time. But we confuse the two. We confuse the API and the system that runs it. Scalability is a really challenging thing, and that gets us to a lot of hipster bullshit, um, which is the, the Silicon Valley, and yes, I come. You can tell I'm wearing a formal Silicon Valley tuxedo here. Um, I can't get MySQL to scale, therefore relational databases don't scale, therefore we must use NoSQL. Um, now, that may be true when you're trying to build a transaction system, but it's probably not true when you're trying to get the data back out. There are two problems at work here. One is transaction and serving, the other is query and analysis. So let's look at a little bit of, of history. Where did we start? So I started building applications when we built them on the same machine and then, and then we separated them when we made a database server because many computers became cheap enough that you could run one machine for a database and put all your application code on the other and there were fewer conflicts and multiple applications could possibly connect to the same database. Early on, one database, one application. And that's where we are with a lot of NoSQL stuff today and there's a reason for this. Uh, the reason is that NoSQL has gotten rid of logical modeling. And the physical and logical model are the same thing. They've recoupled something that in every prior instantiation going back through time, we decoupled. And that's a problem. When your organizing, your organizing principle and your physical storage model are married, you have tight coupling. And when you have tight coupling, your code is going to break a lot. It's going to break because things change. And that's one of the key problems that we have yet to work through because everybody works on the easy 80%, like getting things to scale up, and then starts worrying about things like consistency. And that's exactly what we were doing back then. The first time we put two applications on the same database and realized the database needed to change. Now I've got an optimized physical path, because that's what NoSQL databases do. They give you an optimal physical path to do only one read for this thing and one write for this thing, rather than the normalized problem of six different reads and six different writes, which slows down performance and creates scaling bottlenecks. But when another application tries to read that, now you've got a problem because it's not optimal for him. So somebody pays. So we mucked around with this stuff a lot, and to scale it up, we started adding application servers, in part because the memory limitations here. Each database connection, when I used to work with Oracle version 6, took approximately two megabytes. So a SQL pipe from each application to here did that. But you know, these things aren't all active at the same time. Connection pooling. So we're using an app server and connection pooling to reduce that part of the load back here and give more resource to this and begin to separate some functionality. And then, um, then we throw money at the problem. We make, make the database bigger. So now with a bigger database, uh, we can get to a point, but of course, you're limited by the size of your box. So 
Um, you know, what did we do next? Well, you know, starting in the 90s with, with web, stateless web architectures, we began to do this, you know, split things out. Stateless architectures, break it all apart, load balance between the first tier and the second tier, build your services, get a really big database back here. And, you know, this was the 1990s. This was when I was doing Web 1.0. Um, basically, this is exactly the same as the stuff we were doing on mainframes and Unix machines. Um, you just keep making this bigger until you're spending $2 million a year on Oracle licenses and it's not getting any faster. And at that point, uh, you know, you've got scalability and availability problems because it's a much more complex architecture. You keep making it bigger um, and you, you eventually say, okay, fine, we're going to do a replica. So now you can maybe read out of this thing and only isolate writes to here or just sort of split and load balance. And read-only replicas are great, except that now I've got to get data that's going into here from there. And now I've got a possible consistency problem where if I write a transaction into here and read it from there, I have a problem. So let's shard the data. Because if we shard the data, then it matches the rest of the architecture. Stateless architecture out here broken up into pieces. Back here, we break it up. What is sharding? It's relationally consistent local data sets. So the customer and the orders for that customer and the products for that customer all live in a particular location. It's all one place. It's co-located. And that's, that's a fine thing. Uh, it works wonderfully until you have more than about three, uh, at which point things get horrible. So if you read the Google Spanner paper, which I reference, um, they talk about spending two years on a resharding scheme for AdWords. And AdWords, by the way, is 95% of Google's revenue. That's a lot of money, and that's, they have to be very careful with it. And it's pretty bad when it takes two years, so that's why they had to change that infrastructure out. So what happens is this makes it more complicated because now I've got all of this extra stuff, and I've got to write code to do this. And performance takes a hit because... Even though I'm, I'm only isolating I.O. to one node, I've got all these layers to go through and lines of code to go through, so let's cache it. Let's get the stuff from MySQL or Postgres or whatever we're using, and, and let's use memcached or, or something like that up front. And this is great, except that unless this is as big as this, you have a problem again, which is that you'll have cache misses. So you're optimizing, hopefully, to get the data in cache that's most, most likely to be used. That adds complexity. So from the, the caching thing, you, know, you could expand the caches by using a lot more machines and get a lot more memory, at which point you're really just using this as a persistence layer. But it's still an ACID compliant you know, persistence layer, which has problems. And then you have issues, again, of if I take the data and I write it in here, and then my, my data is stale because of the cache, I can have inconsistencies. So operational complexity goes up. It becomes a nightmare to manage. And so, um, you know, more things to break. More management, more administration, more software complexity, more parts, more points of failure, more latency within the system. Every time we added something in here in an effort to improve performance, we put latency somewhere. Caching is deferred latency, right? Because some point, this cache will have to refresh, or there will be a cache miss. That cache miss eats instructions. Those instructions then say, oh, go fetch the data. Now I do a physical I.O. over here, and I get the data, and then I put it in the cache, and then I can access it. That's an extra code path. So what you're hoping is 80% of the time it hits the cache, and 20% of the time it misses. And if there's a problem, you've just got a really badly performing system. And that's all the kind of stuff we learned all through the 90s into 2000. And so uh, finally, we got a distributed database that could handle this, right? What, it, what did most of these NoSQL databases do? Well, one, many, many servers distributed, so we can scale up and down with the rest of the architecture, but we make it look like one database. So we simplify the programming semantics, gets and puts, and we don't worry about this. The cache is part of the database, so we can eliminate having extra cache layers. Now, not all NoSQL databases do this, but many do. So with the memory caching and this stuff co-located, we've solved the problem of multiple pieces of tooling. Um, it's gotten easier, it's gotten more scalable, and so we're done. Uh, except that there is no such thing as a free lunch. And you should all learn that word because it looks sort of like a Danish or a Dutch word. Uh, it looks very Nordic. 
So Tan Stoffel would be, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch, right? You get something, but you will make a trade-off. This is the devil's bargain of technology. Um, you can't replace a relational database with a NoSQL database unless you're focused on a particular piece of workload. And so you won't see these for a while. And one of my friends at Amazon made a great mistake. He's a statistician. He's on the analytics side. And somebody said, we want to build a system in Mongo. And he said, I don't care what you build it in. I just need this data. And so they built their system. Then they came back and he said, okay, where's my data? And they showed him where his data was. And he got his data. Whoops. And he got his data. But he, he then said, okay, I understand this. Now I need this data with it. And they said, oh, um, because in Mongo, it's not a logical schema. You can't keep the view the same and change the underlying structures or rewrite a query. You dump the data, create a new structure, and put the data back. Uh, there's other ways to do it, but most people don't know those patterns like lazy rewriting. So they went off and they spent three weeks and they did this, and so now the application was writing data in the way that it could be consumed by the statistician, who then said, oh, this is interesting. There's a shoulder. Uh, it's a statistical anomaly in the data. Um, I need this and this with this. And then the Mongo guy said, oh. And they uh, went back and spent two weeks and got him his data. And so he said, you know, this isn't working. We need to try a different database. Um, so that is my Mongo story. Uh, the problem was we scaled this part, right? Mongo or Cassandra or, or React or, you know, all these wonderful databases, they scale serving workloads and transaction processing. Online analytical processing or query processing, query does not equal transaction. No SQL databases or no join databases. Now, that means that we're ignoring a whole half of the enterprise, the people who need data not the people who create and serve up data, the people who think about it, the finance department, the marketing people. So how did we scale this? This is my career living through uh, these nightmares. Um, we started again, transaction processing against the database, and we wrote reports against it. Every report is an application, just like a NoSQL database, right? Each thing that you want to report on ends up being an application because you have to get and munge and do stuff with data, or you pull it out and put it somewhere else. So we scaled by you know, writing one report and optimizing each one of these things. We made the database bigger, right? Uh, we need to add another core to the mainframe when mainframes finally got multiprocessors or more water pipes because it's running too hot. So then we decided to replicate the data, right? You take this database and you lift it up and you drop it down over here. Now you have two databases, but you've isolated workloads. This one takes transactions, and every time a big report starts up, it doesn't slow down your transactions. Slowing down transactions stops the revenue of the company, so that was always a bad thing, and we would get yelled at. So we do this. Now your only thing is how and when you move data from here to here and maintain the replica. But then what you discover is, of course, the real problem is not just that you had two workloads. The problem is that this database schema is his problem that he was just describing. It's a highly normalized transaction-specific schema. A transaction-specific schema is great for transactions. It limits the amount of I.O. that you're doing at the expense of causing a lot of pain when you try to pull all the data back together again. The more tables, the more joins, the more difficult it is. And so we, we re-schematized. Data warehousing is really just this with a different schema. In order to get this, you have to do something called ETL, extract, transform, and load. Take this and this and meld them, throw out this, denormalize this piece, clean this up, standardize the data. It's like doing font standardization. Make sure that each one of these references to a person and a place and a product are all using the same nomenclature, the same value domain, so that we can link the data, which is a problem in the Hadoop world as well. Um, you have to do this to make the data accessible and usable. And then we replaced handwritten applications to generate reports with query tools. Because this is a SQL database, this thing can generate a query based on what you're asking. So we can introduce a metadata layer that separates it, that says, I want this, this, and this. A piece of code in here says, well, that means I have to go to that table, that table, and that table, and it generates a query. And the beauty of the relational database is it takes the query and it says, 
I could get it this way or I could get it that way. And it tries to guess which way will be faster. And in things like Oracle and SQL Server and DB2, it always guesses wrong. And so you, you buy more hardware. And that's exactly what we did. I spent years doing this kind of work. Uh, we started to do caching. Does anybody know what OLAP is, actual multi-dimensional OLAP? Yeah, a few of you. This is good. Uh, SQL Server Analysis Services is OLAP. Um, essentially, you're taking data and you are creating a model where all of the attributes link to metrics on the outside and it's kind of, you, you can implement it as a hypercube or a bunch of different models, but essentially you're creating a highly optimized retrieval system, much like a NoSQL store, that allows you to get very quickly any pre-calculated aggregate that's out there, but you pay the price by having to build that cache. And it's inflexible because it's smaller than that, and so if this wants something that's not in the cache, in an OLAP schema, good luck. In a SQL-based query schema, you can get it. Uh, but of course, this is way faster than that, just like with transaction processing. And so these things began to take chunks of data and cache and isolate, and that's kind of where we got to. And then starting, I mean, it started in 1986, but uh, it, that was when the first one terabyte query system was shipped. Uh, we created distributed SQL systems, and these took off about 2002. That's when a lot of venture capital went into new models of parallel databases. Teradata is the only, well, Teradata and Sybase IQ are the only two that really have lasted since that period, except for a British company that used to be called White Cross, it's now called Cognitio. And they are distributed scale-out databases, multi-node, fully relational, uh, in pretty much every instance ACID compliant. You bulk load all of your data in here, and then same model on the other side. But now you have the ability to not buy a bigger box, you just add more nodes as you need more resources as your data grows. And so we now have distributed query databases, which are different from distributed transaction databases like a NoSQL database, because they're optimized for this. One optimizes get in, one optimizes get out. Two workloads, similar architectures, load balanced front ends, distributed caching layers, and scalable distributed parallel databases. It's just that this one's relational, the NoSQL one is not. These two things are hard to do on one. So the posit that NoSQL means I'm going to throw out Oracle only means I'm going to throw out Oracle behind my website. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw out Oracle for my query schema because the workloads are different. You can't do that query workload in Hive. You can't do it in Oracle. You can't do it, sorry, well, actually it's true. You can't do it in Oracle, but that's probably because you're using an EMC SAN. My goal here is to insult as many people as possible, so I hope I'm, I'm getting there. Which means we need to look at, at the, the stores, right? And the, the hype market, big data is unprecedented, and I've been mucking around with data that was big and small for a long time. And you know, one of the things is when you say that, you're assuming that there was no past. In our industry, we tend to throw all the manuals out every five years or so because something new has come along and we don't have any history. And there's a difference between not having a past and having to invent something and just rejecting that past in favor of something else. You know, one is a form of creation and invention and one is a form of being a teenager. And so reinventing the wheel is something we in the software business do really well and I've done it for a long, long time. And this is, a, you know, this is the history of databases from the 1960s. Multi-value databases, nesting structures, right? So customer, order, order, order. Stored in one record, read once. IMS was at its time the fastest transaction processing database on the planet. Um, because it was multi-valued and hierarchical, just like almost all of these NoSQL stores we're talking about. And you know, then we got relational and system R, Quell and SQL, there was a little bit of a tiff between these two guys, so IBM renamed it SQL, got rid of the E's and the U, uh, because none of this is about you, it's all about the economy. And uh, we get DB2 and all of these things, and it goes on and on and on. And of course, we go back and forth, right? Multi-value hierarchical, relational, relational. SQL gets standardized, it truly wasn't standardized until 1986. We get object orientation, network databases, things like that. None of this stuff actually ever worked. And so uh, we, we threw that back out and kept buying Oracle Informix, Dide, DB2, SQL Server. And then we end up with this stuff starting in the early 2000s, which is, which is interesting. We've got the parallel SQL databases and the parallel NoSQL databases. And then what's happening now is a, a different workload 
computational analytic workloads driving things like this, which are array processing and linear algebra, which is not the same as relational processing and counting in sets, which is not the same as dealing with eaches and rows in a NoSQL database. So the essential history can be boiled down as in 1970, we have NoSQL. In 1980, you should all know SQL. By 2000, we don't want SQL. By 2005, every single NoSQL database says, oh, people want to join data. We need a SQL-like query language. And so everybody starts adding SQL back in, which is what things like Impala and Hadoop are about. And uh, now we're back to 2013, where Google has told us, no, um, you need SQL. And so uh, you know, relational has a lot of great stuff going for it, but it's got some really sucky things as a developer, like static schemas, no rich typing, only a few data primitives. Everything has to be designed up front and in advance. It's sort of the anti-pattern for both deployment and development of Agile. Um, and uh, it doesn't do well for a number of things, including developer support. And so what didn't I list here? I didn't list performance and scalability because bigness is not the problem. Uh, this is a chart from a few years ago a friend of mine put together. Um, these are the publicly announced, now I know of bigger ones, but publicly announced databases. This curve is traditional database market, DB2, SQL Server, that sort of thing. You can see that it's actually hanging in pretty well around 100 to 200 terabytes. Yes, these things do actually run at that scale. But between here and here, you're talking about the petabyte range, the largest data warehouses using uh, uh, MPP databases, distributed query databases like Nateza or a Teradata or a Vertica. And then up here we've got, of course, the, the Hadoop kinds of things. And most people will fall very comfortably in this range. And if you're doing query processing, you're kind of crazy to still be using these things um, because this is the performance bump, the scalability bump, which is from hundreds of terabytes to multiple petabytes. Um, I'm not going to talk about how you emulate a key value store, but I'm including it in the materials because it's interesting because people always tell me, oh, well, we just have this one big thing and it's log structured records. Well, guess what? You have to query log structured records and it's hard to do fast. Case in point, eBay. Um, a friend of mine at eBay uh, gave me the slides that he was using at a talk, and it's talking about this particular system which records log structured data from 6,000 different applications. It is uh, this guy right here, 40 petabytes. 40 petabytes in a relational database. When you query this thing, like the, these are the query techniques I'm not going to talk about, but when you query this thing, you're talking trillions of rows. Your filter set is 40 to 50 billion rows, and the response time out of this for the 150 plus concurrent users hitting it is approximately 30 seconds on a query like that. So. Um, to say that relational databases don't scale means that you have a serious scale problem or you're doing something wrong. Uh, this is how you do it. Uh, Hadoop is not the answer because Hadoop is in fact highly inefficient. What Hadoop gives you is a very inexpensive and very fast to write to storage layer from which you can feed other things or on which you can operate directly. But you don't build interactive query systems on it. Hive and Impala are not going to be there for a long, long time. And so, um, what you're getting is both order of magnitude improvements, multi-order, right? This is what most people buy. Here's EMC, and then here's just buying some disks and shoving them into nodes or getting virtual machines. Most people do not live at this end of the curve. Microsoft, uh, there's a paper in the references, studied 174,000 analytic jobs. How big was their data? Does anybody know the answer to this or want to guess? Shout out some numbers. Anybody? How big was the median size of analytics? Oh, come on. 300 gigabytes. Anybody else? More or less? less. Who thinks more? Less. Less? less? Well, less wins. 14. <laughs> right. I got a petabyte of data, and 14 gigabytes is my analytic result set. All right. So the problem is probably not what we think it is. It's not bigness. Bigness is only a problem down at that storage and filter layer, but once I start working with it, it's nested structures and hierarchies and large amounts and non-standard stuff. It's deep structure. That's probably the single biggest thing. Complex and hard to manage. This is a piece of a, of a core metrics tracker. I work a lot with this kind of stuff. And yeah, there's embedded structure in here, so it doesn't fit nicely in a relational schema because you have to unpack this stuff and you end up with these normalization problems. Everything on this page 
refers to exactly the same thing, which is aspirin. I have a headache. Well, take this, or that, or that, or that, or that. These are systematic nomenclatures. There's structure in there which you can use to identify and extract things. When we talk about unstructured, we really mean unmodeled because we haven't constructed the model to hold that thing in a consistent and repeatable ex and extractable way. And you know, this is just a document. This is all of the word linkages in a document corpus. Um, now, one of the things when you get all of that event structure data or all of that data that you've extracted into one big, long, deep table is that there's deep structure inside the data set. It's not this piece of a record with its structure, it's a hundred million of these records that define a pattern. And so what you do with analysis is essentially extract patterns, which themselves are data, and then have to store them back, or you rerun the analysis again. And so you're generating sets of data out of sets of data. And that gets us to computational workloads, because we forgot about this part, which is different from this, which is different from this. Queries, transactions, computations are all different. And the holy grail that everybody thought Hadoop was going to be was data storage, data retrieval, and computation on one magic platform. And that is one magic platform because it doesn't exist today. It is the holy grail and everybody's trying to get there by doing different things. Database vendors on one hand, big data guys on another hand. But you really have to break the problem down. Are you talking about a lot of data or a little data? Are you talking about a lot of iterations and floating point calculations or a lot of vector math or a little bit? If you have a little bit of data, you have a lot of options over on that left side. If you have a lot of data, you're kind of over here. So it's analytics and data. There's big and little analytics and big and little data. And no technical solution will solve them all. Databases have solved the volume problem for query and aggregation. In fact, eBay proved that a Teradata box was cheaper than the Hadoop cluster to do sorting, filtering, and aggregations. And so they shift their workloads now to favor that box for that stuff and the Hadoop cluster for different things. So, uh, by the way, block synchronous processing is the thing that MapReduce can't do because MapReduce turns out to really suck for graph structured data. And so if you're using graph structured data, you kind of want to look at BSP and CGM and things like that. But high computation, low data, concurrency, right? Lots of users, what us web app people deal with. Um, most products could do one really well and maybe two. Nobody does all three, not at scale. And so what we have then is, you know, NoSQL has taken the relational and the management system out and given us a database. Hadoop has taken the online part out because everything is batch. Uh, Hadoop and Pig is like mainframe and job control language if you're old enough to remember what that was. If not, that's what the internet's for. So, you know, maybe these aren't the databases that we're looking for. And the reason is because of all of the stuff that the database does for you. Standard API query layers, transaction consistency. This thing right here is the single biggest thing it gives you. A query optimizer. A three table join means six different ways that you could actually order the join. Each one of which is going to give you a different performance. But you can join data by merging it by using a hash structure, by doing a nested lookup where you iterate one set and probe the other set. So let's say you've got three of those. Well, now it's 36 different ways. And each one of those has a different performance characteristic based on the distribution of the data as it's been stored. That's what a query optimizer does. A complex query that does aggregations and group buys and things like that can have millions of possible things. And what we've said is, oh, Mr. Mongo developer, you go figure that out because that falls in your domain. Data navigation, domains, you know, all of this stuff falls into your domain here. And we're going to give you access and storage, right? It's not what it's designed for. And that's what a relational database is designed for. So you have to think about this, but also transaction consistency plays a big factor. Now, query optimization, as I've said, is very complex. If you fail at it, you become a rocket scientist. Um, I used to work at NASA, uh, and I tried to work on database kernels, so I'm the proof point. Um, in that world, this is you, it sucks, I've been there. Um, most people don't realize that there's more than one kind of join, right? There are many kinds of joins. And so, take that 36 and multiply it by the types of joins that you have possible, and that's every option for one query. So every program being a query turns into a problem. The real important point here is simply that workloads are what define the platform. 
operational, analytic, and scientific have different performance requirements, different resource requirements, and it's very hard to blend them. One focuses on this, one focuses on aggregate queries, and one focuses on mathy stuff. So you want a platform that can support all of these things, and that means probably multiple tiers, right? This is why Hadoop is so interesting. Big base data tier can deal with a lot of these things, and then you start separating stuff out. And so you end up with raw data, standardized data, and then the enhanced, cleaned up, data warehousey kind of data that's been just the high value data in my more expensive systems, and then finally my derived analytic output. So you have a food supply chain kind of a thing going on where some people need the raw grain, some people make dough, some people just want to eat donuts. Those are your executives, by the way. Um, and so what you really have to ask is this question. What is the problem for which this particular thing is the answer? And the answer is always, it depends. There's nuance here, and so you have to think like a designer. Now, the final point. So Google came along. The NoSQL fanboys are a little bit aghast at this because they said, uh, F1 is the answer. What's F1? Well, we went from MapReduce, which was in 2004, to um, uh, Megastore and Dremel and Spanner and F1, right? So there have been four evolutions and a few asides. It's a distributed SQL database. They said it couldn't be done. It's a distributed SQL transaction database. It does globe-spanning multi-data centers, single database instance with ACID compliant semantics, which means full transaction control. It's a SQL database because they said, guess what? It's actually kind of hard to do this stuff. It's synchronous replication and transparent data distribution, which eases your operational problems, which you have with sharding and replication. Uh, protobufs, if you know what they are, you can store a protobuf as a data type in a column, and you can actually query protobufs, just like you query tables. We've blended structures, which includes nesting structures, with relational tables in the same thing with some schema, ex uh, schema and SQL extensions to query them from a SQL statement, which has been modified, which means it can be optimized by smart optimizer people, which means you don't have to figure that stuff out, which means I can now do big, ugly queries and I can do transactions in the same system. This is one evolution and it's a very interesting one. And the other thing is you can still keep doing your MapReduce stuff. And so uh, this is the user-facing latency of acid-based transactions. It's about 200, mega, uh, 200 millisecond round trip, right? So it's not much different than what you get out of your NoSQL databases when you add in all the code you have to go through to do the transaction bits. This is what they said in the F1 paper, uh, just two quotes, right? Concurrency in the application as opposed to in the database, very hard, lots of edge cases. 80% is easy, 20% is hard, the 20% is what most of the, these key value store kinds of things make us deal with. And the second part is this, which is that you have impedance problems and mismatches and other things, getting data to and from protobufs and other stuff, so we've got to fix the relational side and we've got to fix the NoSQL side, and that's what they've attempted to do. And so, you know, why NoSQL will fail has very little to do with uh, actually failing because it's not really failing, it's evolving. It's merging back into the code lines of the other databases. And we're going to end up with something new that's part one and part the other. And the reason the relational database won the commercial market war is because SQL was a standard. Once you have a standard API to a system, everybody can implement a different engine to execute to that standard. We can have a Teradata that does queries. We can have a DB2 that does transactions. We can have a whole host of things in an ecosystem, and then we can build up tools around it, query tools, data integration tools, and other things, because they all talk to that same API. SQL is not really a language. SQL is an API. It's a programmable API, and that makes it different. It's a declarative programmable API. So what we have is that it's not really a revolution, it's more of an evolution, and evolutions are really all about parties. And so the bottom line here is if you go and read these Google papers, it also tells you that if you procrastinate long enough, most problems will solve themselves because somebody will build a product that you can buy. And that goes along with the other thing, which is that the future will be exactly like the past, only far more expensive. <laughs> so 
Uh, thanks for staying with me. Uh, the references will be included in the PDF here so you can link to all of the papers that I'm talking about that get into the gory fun part, which is all the technical details. And there's a whole lot of uh, CC attribution, so those are there too. And by law, I am required to do this or they'll throw me in jail. Uh, yeah. so thank you. Mark. Thank you.